you know usually when you work with uh, the government as we've done in the past an idea can take many years to go from a, a concept to actually happening on the telescope from the initial announcement about us uh, becoming a part of Breakthrough Listen to the beginnings of data was only a six month time period. So we aren't actually developing the hardware for this. That's being done at the University of California, Berkeley. Instead, we're providing the infrastructure. So this is the Breakthrough Listen cluster. It mostly consists of compute nodes that have uh, 24 five terabyte drives. We have 16 of them. Works out to about two petabytes of storage. Each one has a Titan X GPU card in it for processing the data and uh, of course a 10 gig network card to bring in the data from the FPGAs. And it's just it's just a lot of fun. It's a, it's a different way to observe with the telescope, you know, where you're really out picking and choosing targets not really on the fly but you know pretty pretty freely and the whole process of bringing on board not just the the hardware for this but kind of a new way of cooling the hardware which has been pretty neat to watch and and, and fun to get that installed here. All of that's gone really well. So this room has its own air conditioner that was here before we came along and they have a lot of their own equipment from the Green Bank Telescope and other instruments in here and so we're adding a lot of disk drives and CPUs and GPUs and they produce a lot of heat. The hardware coming on board just to process the data needed for Breakthrough Listen is, is pretty substantial. The second rack is really kind of pushing the capacity of their current, current chiller and so we were faced with the decision of whether to buy a whole new air conditioning, bigger air conditioning unit for the room. So working with the, the, the Breakthrough Listen group, our engineers in that group uh, decided to put in this water-cooled system, which is pretty exciting. So basically it's just pipes coming in and literally using water to cool the, um, the hardware itself. It costs more up front to install it, but then as you operate it, the operating costs are far less than running a big air conditioning unit. It's way more efficient at heat transfer, because you don't have to cool the whole giant space, you just cool, goes right to the hot spots on the chips where they get hot, and it's going to go outside to an outdoor heat exchanger that basically just has fans on it. The difference between the warm water temperature that the chips heat the water to and the outside ambient temperature, there's enough of a differential that the heat can, even though it's a hot summer day, the water is still warmer and will still get cooler outside and come back in cooler. And so this is great, and not only is it going to cool the Breakthrough Listen hardware, but it's a system that we can now use anytime we put a new piece of hardware in there. So if we're going to, say, uh, replace our, or, or increase our spectrometer or our pulsar back end, we could actually use this technology to keep it cool. So this is uh, one of our compute nodes. It's a dual Xeon system. These heat sinks are going to be removed and replaced with water blocks. There are these little copper blocks that go on there, and you've put this green tubing that will go through uh, some panel they're building to go on the back side. And it goes, water comes in one side, circulates through the system. We're going to have a copper plate on the GPU as well, this, but it also has uh, fixtures for the plastic tubing to go on. And uh, then it comes back out and goes through the whole system. I'm trying to think when we doubled the cooling, it was probably six, seven years ago. You know, we're just, we're at the max again, so I think this is a, this is a great path forward for us because we can't just keep adding these massive coolers in the, into the room. It's, it's pretty impractical. Tubing is green and it's made for gamers and uh, if you shine ultraviolet light on it, it glows bright green. And so we might get some ultraviolet LEDs so we can have the, the glowing effect. Eight times eight, I guess, so 64 gigabytes of memory. The memory intensity that we have is mostly on the disk drive side of things. So this is, these pop out. This is a disk drive, Toshiba 5 terabytes. It's loaded up with 24 of them. We are looking for more partners. The, the NSF partnership right now is at about 60% and their intent is to go down to about 30% over the next couple of years. So we're looking for partners both, interest, both interested in the, uh, the research side of things but also interested in sponsoring some of the instruments on site. Like I said, the NSF uh, funding is going to continue to decrease and we are needing to find additional partners here. West Virginia University stepped up very early on as a, as a partner for us and that's been wonderful. They've got a lot of students coming through now, which has been great. Uh, Nanograv, which is a uh, national uh, pulsar group looking for gravitational waves using pulsars, has also stepped up. And then, of course, we have a major partner with Breakthrough Listen, which has been fantastic to really have them come through. Not only um, on the funding-wise, but the project itself is exciting, plus their willingness to use the data for other scientific projects has been very exciting, too. No, they're all Titan X's. We're going to switch to 1080s now, though.